thanks for joining us again for New City Church Online. We're so glad that you're spending part of your day with us. We pray that today's message is very practical and very encouraging for anyone who's joining us today. If this is your first time, we're glad that you're here. My name is Eric, and I'm the pastor at New City Church, and we've been praying for you. We're so glad that somebody invited you to New City Church Online. Maybe they shared this video with you. Maybe they're watching it with you, but we want you to know that you are welcome here, and we're glad that you're here. And we pray that today's message is exactly what you need to hear from God. And so what I want to do today is I want to jump right into our message today because we're in the middle of a spiritual growth campaign here at our church called 40 Days of Prayer. We're taking a concentrated time to pray to God because we know that if we spend time in prayer, God's going to do some things on our behalf. And so we've spent the first three weeks or so just kind of laying some groundwork about who God is and how good he is for us and what that means for us and how much we can pray and the ways that we can look up to God and look within ourselves before we begin to pray. But today, I promise you, is very practical because I want to teach you how to pray throughout your day. I don't want it to just be a random thing that you do or almost like a fire extinguisher that you break in case of emergency, but I want you to be able to pray throughout your day. And so when you look at the Apostle Paul, He's, he's a writer of about two-thirds of what we call the New Testament. He writes letters to churches, uh, develops a lot of our theology and our understanding about God. But every time you look at the Apostle Paul, and you can learn a lot about his writing and about him, it's obvious that he prayed all the time. In almost every book that he authors, he starts with prayer. He mentions things like, I am continually praying. I'm constantly praying. I pray without ceasing. I never stop praying for you. And my question is, and your question should be in a, in a campaign like this, 40 days of prayer, is how do we do that? I mean, how do we get to the point where we're like Paul and we're praying without ceasing, that it just comes naturally to us? Well, I want to start with a very practical verse that Paul gives us in the New Testament book of Ephesians. Ephesians 6, 18 says this, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests, with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Now, I don't know if you caught it, but in this verse alone, very quickly, Paul gives us seven quick things that we can do concerning prayer. I want to run through those and kind of let that be the groundwork today as we pray throughout our day. First thing he says, he says, pray in the Spirit. Now, what does that mean? Uh, some of us have an understanding of the Holy Spirit. Some of us don't, but here's what it means. It means that we let God lead us as we pray, which sometimes means that we're quiet. And we let the Holy Spirit impress things upon us. If, if someone comes to your mind when you're going to God in prayer, pray for that person. If you're driving by that person's house or where they work or their school, pray for them. If you get an idea in your mind, if you're worried about something, pray about it. Do it in that moment and depend on God's Spirit. So we pray in the Spirit. It says on all occasions, number two. See, I want you to know that there's never a bad time to pray. There's never an inappropriate time to pray. If, if God is leading you to pray for somebody, with somebody, over a situation, you pray on all occasions. Every time and anywhere, we can pray all the time. Number three, he says with all kinds of prayers. Did you know that there are hundreds of different kinds of prayers? It, it depends on your emotions sometimes. It depends on your circumstances sometimes. But I, I, if you have some time, and I, and I pray that you do, take some time to read the book of Psalms. It's right in the middle of your Bible. I guarantee you, you will find a prayer for every emotion known to man. If you don't know what to pray, I tell this to people a lot, go to the book of Psalms and begin to pray through a certain psalm and see what God reveals to you. He also says, number four, that we pray with all kinds of requests. You need to know that there's no subject of prayer that's off limits. There's nothing that you can't pray about. That's who God is. He's our loving Heavenly Father. If you're interested in it, God's interested in it. If it's worrying you, it's, it's where you need to go to God. If you worry about it, pray about it. Now, I believe this. If we prayed as much as we worried, we would have a lot less to worry about. So Paul's telling us, pray with all kinds of requests. Listen, worry never changes anything. But when we start to pray, we can realize that prayer does change things. Maybe we start saying this. If I'm worrying about it, I might as well pray about it. It could be something physical, mental, financial, Emotional, we pray with all kinds of requests. Number five, I love this. He says to be alert. If we're going to pray all the time, we need to be ready. We need to be alert. When we're ready, it actually means that we have a plan. It's about making a plan for our prayers, a lot of what we're going to cover today. 
Spontaneous prayers are great. I've been, I've been part of spontaneous prayers. I've prayed spontaneous prayers. I've had people pray spontaneous prayers over me. And they are what's needed in that moment. But the Bible tells us that we also need to plan our prayers. We need to think them out. We need to be strategic. We need to make a plan. Number six, he tells us to always keep on praying. We cannot give up when it comes to prayer. We've said this many times over the last three weeks. We can't give up when it comes to prayer. We, we can't give up when we feel like we don't know what to do or what to pray. We can't give up when we don't hear the answer right away. We keep praying. We can't give up when we hear an answer that we don't like. We keep praying. And finally, number seven, he says, pray for all of the Lord's people. See, we've got to pray for everybody. Our, chair, our church family is getting bigger, not just at our in-person services, but our online church as well. And we want it to keep growing. And right here's a command from Scripture that we've got a, a lot of people to pray for. We can't do this if we're only praying a few times a week, few minutes here and there. We can't do this if we're only worried about ourselves. I want to read that verse to you again. Pray in the Spirit on all occasions, all kinds of prayers, all kinds of requests. With this in mind, be alert, be ready, and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Now see, to accomplish this, we've got to learn how to pray throughout our day. And there's two different ways to do this. Number one, we keep a running conversation with God. Number two, we need to schedule our prayer times throughout the day. So here's one way to pray throughout the day, and I'll let you know this comes with time. This almost becomes a spiritual habit that comes with a lot of practice. A lot of our habits in life that we get good at, it takes time to develop it into a a formidable and permanent habit. And I'll say keeping a running conversation with God throughout the day, that takes time. But we can do it, because what do we do? We talk to God like we're talking to each other, like we would talk to anybody. We've established that. We don't need to complicate prayer. God loves prayers that are sincere, that are simple. Now, one of the first things that we can do to keep it simple, to keep it sincere, to keep it consistent, is to just treat prayer with God like a conversation. Here's the key. If you want to keep a conversation going with God all day, just don't end the prayer. Don't get to the point, maybe until your head hits the pillow at night, to say, okay, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Just keep talking throughout your day. If it worries you, if it bothers you, if something comes to your mind, if there's something you're thankful for, if somebody pops into your head, if something comes up, talk to God about it. And there may be times of rest in between. That's understandable. But then pick the prayer right back up again. It it needs to be like breathing. And again, this is a habit that takes some time. If you think about it, you don't need to think about breathing. You just do it. Thank goodness we're not in charge of making sure we're breathing all the time. If we don't breathe... Very simply, we die. Prayer needs to be like spiritual breathing. Prayer is to your soul, but breathing is to your body. It needs to become as natural as breathing so that you don't have to think about it. Again, it comes with time. Now, right now, a lot of us probably have to think about praying. We've got to sit down. We've got to make a plan. We've got to say, okay, now is my time to pray. But no matter what happens to us, We've got to get to the point where we don't even have to think about it. That we have a running conversation with God every day. Because here's what I know. We do talk to ourselves all the time. It's really hard for psychologists and doctors to calculate how many words we say to ourselves every day, but it, it numbers in the tens of thousands. Because you are your biggest fan. No matter what happens to us, in that moment we feel it, we taste it, we touch it, We smell it, we sense it, we talk to ourselves about everything we experience in life. We go through the worry in our head, we make a plan, we get to a situation, we try to make a a, a solution for it as fast as we can. But when you learn to have a running conversation with God, it's not hard to make that switch. Instead of talking just to yourself all the time, bring God into the conversation. Make it a conversational prayer. Remember, we pray in the Spirit on all occasions, Ephesians 6.18. We can talk to God anywhere anytime, about anything. Now, another thing about keeping a running conversation with God, I've I've heard people say like this, well, I just don't feel like praying. And we've been there, I'm honest, sometimes I don't feel like praying. But I want you to understand something. If I don't feel like praying, it just means I'm not praying what I feel. I'll say that again. If I don't feel like praying, it just means I'm not praying what I feel. If the only time we pray is when we pray stuff that we think God wants to hear, well, that's boring. And we're missing out on the power of prayer. You you need to learn that when having a running conversation with God means that you're praying about what you're feeling in that moment. 
Sometimes when we're nervous about something, we don't think about praying, but we've got to bring God into that. In our anxiety, in our frustration, in our anger, in our pain, in our loneliness, when we're overwhelmed, when we're sad, when we're happy, when we're angry, we bring God in and we invite him and say, God, I need you as part of this conversation. Help me sort this out. See, when we don't feel like praying, it just means we're praying about the wrong things. When we keep a running conversation with God, you're going to begin to see that you feel free to talk to him about anything and everything, even when we don't feel like praying. We keep a running conversation with God. We pray what we feel. Paul would simply say in 1 Thessalonians 5.12, pray continually. We keep a running conversation with God. That's the first way that we pray throughout our day. Now, for some of us, we need to make a plan before we can get to the point where we have a running conversation with God. I realize that. Don't beat yourself up. We've got to start somewhere. Some of you are at the point where you have running conversations with God all day. We have a lot to learn from you And your faith inspires us. But for a lot of us, we need to make a plan so that it becomes a running conversation. And I want to help you with that today. The second way to pray throughout your day is sounds very simple. But you schedule your prayer times through the day. You schedule them. Now, this isn't a new idea. This isn't groundbreaking. From the beginning of time, people have have scheduled their prayer times. The Jews in the Old Testament would schedule their prayer times. There were set times, fixed hours for certain prayers. We know from the book of Daniel, for one example, that Daniel prayed three times a day. It tells us he prayed at morning, he prayed at noon, and he prayed at night. Now, if we fast forward to the New Testament, where we talk about Jesus and the Apostle Paul, the disciples, at that time, the known world was taken over by the Roman Empire. One of the things that the Roman Empire would do in every town is they would build what was called a forum. In the middle of that forum, they would build a bell tower. And the Roman bell tower would ring six or seven times a day, sometimes to indicate the start of the work day, the end of the work day, the middle of the day for lunch and break. It would ring at 6 a.m., 9 a.m., what we know as those times, 12 p.m., 3 p.m., 6 p.m., 9 p.m. It was like clockwork. Everyone who was under Roman rule, which was most of the ancient world, would hear these bells, and it would be that way for hundreds of years. Do you know what began to happen? Well, the Jews and the Christians, just like everybody else in the Roman rule, would hear these bells. And so what they started to do is they used those Roman bells as indicators for times to pray. It helped them to develop this habit of prayer anytime the bells rang. It became part of their day. In church tradition, this practice became known as the liturgy of the hours. Even today, our Catholic brothers and sisters have the liturgy of the hours. And they still use some of the Roman terms, third hour, sixth hour, ninth hour, talk about the vespers and the prime, all the different words that are used for prayers throughout the day. Now, over time, the monks who would live in these monasteries would also put bells in the monastery. They'd have a large bell tower in almost every monastery. And part of the duty of one of the monks was to ring these bells every three hours to signal one thing that it was time to pray, just like the Roman bell towers. In fact, in the 1400s, 1400 years, it was like this. Some of the monks got together and started to think, this seems like a bad deal. We always need to have somebody who's awake and who's ready to ring the bell as reminders. So what the monks started to do is they created a mechanical instrument that would ring bells on the same schedule as these prayer reminders. The Latin word for bell is clock. Now, have you ever heard of that word? Of course we have. Now, I want you to know something. History will back this up, but clocks were invented in order to make time for prayer. It's the whole reason we have clocks. Now, today, we think that the clock was invented to make life faster or to rush things or to schedule things. We've secularized secularized the original intent of the clock. We've done that with a lot of things that the church has come up with. We have clocks for everything, every type of clock you can imagine. But the clock, its original intent was invented so that everybody would know that it was time to pray. In fact, Psalm 119 tells us, seven times a day I praise you for your righteous laws. See, over the centuries, daily times of prayer throughout the day began to be known, like I said, as the liturgy of the hours or the divine office. Gradually, it has become very complicated. There are volumes and volumes of these prayers. 
It's massive to learn. It's contained in thousands and thousands of pages. Today, I don't want to go through the liturgy of the hours. I want to talk about something simpler. It's something that we can memorize. It's something that will have natural triggers throughout our day to remind us to pray. It can be based on some of the phrases of the Lord's Prayer. Now, the Lord's Prayer, again, you might have recited it as a child in church. It's not simply a prayer that we pray. You need to hear this. It's a model for how we pray. When Jesus talked to his disciples about this prayer, he never said, you must pray like this. He told them you should pray this way. Nowhere in the Bible are we commanded to recite the Lord's Prayer. In fact, God says multiple times in Scripture, don't say the same thing over and over and over again. That becomes vain repetition. So I want to talk about a typical day in your life, maybe the liturgy of the hours, the bell towers. Let's modernize it and bring it into our day and how we can bring prayer into every moment. When these moments come up in your day, I pray that you remember that it's time to talk to God. Number one, in the morning, we get up and start our day with gratitude. Now, we get up in the morning before breakfast, before anything else. We should get up by starting and being grateful to God. This is the time to tell God all the things that we're thankful for. Now, I hope you understand that we are the ones who decide what attitude we're going to have when we wake up each morning. It could be grumbling and griping and groaning, or we could get up with gratitude. It's our choice. Now, did you know that there have been scientific studies that doctors have discovered that the single healthiest emotion known to man is gratitude? They say gratitude actually makes you healthier mentally, emotionally, and physically. It's good for your health. They say that you will decide the rest of your day most likely in the first eight minutes of your day. So why not start our day with gratitude? Why not start every morning in gratitude to God and thank Him for the things He's done for you? 1 Corinthians 4, 7 says it this way, For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you didn't? It's telling us we need to be grateful. What gratitude does, first thing, is it gets our focus off of ourselves, off of our situations. We may be carrying problems from the day before, but it gets us off those for a moment and puts them on our loving Father in heaven. We put our focus on the Father who meets our needs. Jesus says this in Matthew 6, For your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven. Every good and perfect gift is from above, James says, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. First thing that we need to do when we get out of bed, praying throughout our days, we say something like, I thank my Father in heaven for His consistent love. And I will now take time to recall all of the ways that he is good to me. We get up in the morning with gratitude. And so we start moving throughout our day. And the next thing that we can do, number two, is we bless God's name at breakfast. Jesus would say again in verse 9, This then is how you should pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed or holy be your name. What does this mean? Well, it means that we're giving honor. We're giving respect and praise It's a theological word known as adoration. We adore God. We bless Him. We praise Him. We give respect to His name. Psalm 145, 2 puts it this way, Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Now, it's not just every Sunday. It's not just on the weekend. This is an everyday thing. We bless His name at breakfast. So what's the big deal about God's name? A lot of people talk about God's name and how powerful it is. Now, if you read through the book of Psalms, just the book of Psalms, the name of God is mentioned at least 80 times. It says things like, bless the name of the Lord, praise the name of the Lord, give thanks to the name of the Lord, exalt the name of the Lord. What is the big deal about God's name? You need to understand understand something about a name. Your name is your character. Your name is who you are. The same goes with God. When God makes a promise to us, and by the way, there's over 7,000 of them in the Bible, it's based on his good name. He's consistent. He can be depended on. He has integrity. We take time to bless his name because it centers us on how good he is. Now, in the Bible, did you know that God alone has about 100 names in the Hebrew and in the Greek? So I was just got to ask, why does anybody need 100 names? But when it comes to God, each of those names represents a character quality of him. So we bless his name at breakfast because it reminds us of a few things. It reveals who God is. And sometimes we need those reminders. 
One way God reveals himself, he says, I am Abba Father, or I am your loving Father. Some of us need to hear that from God. I am Eldea, which means I am the God who knows you, and I know everything. And I would add to it, and I still love you. We need to be reminded that God knows what we're going through. It's not surprising to him. Rely on his name. Another name of God is Jehovah Rapha. He is the God who heals us. He can heal us in our mind and in our hearts, our physical bodies. He can heal and restore broken relationships. That's who he is. El Shaddai, God's name meaning that he is the almighty God. He's more powerful than we ever will be, and he's got things under control way better than we do. Jehovah Jireh, God says, I am your provider, which means he knows what we need, even before we ask. Why not go to him and get him involved in what we need in life? Jehovah Shalom, God tells us that he is our peace. We need a lot of peace right now in our lives. See, all prayer is really based on how much we know God. The more we know God, the less we're going to worry. The more that we know God, the, less, the more we're going to relax. The more we know God, the more confident we will be. I love how Psalm chapter 9 puts it. Those who know your name will trust you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. So at breakfast, we bless his name and we check his character. Number three, now we're at mid-morning and we need to remember what matters most. See, we need to do this because there's going to be days where we need to take a breath in the middle of the day and just stop. But we just need to stop and take inventory of what matters most. So we need to get the big picture, and God reveals that. We, when we've lost our direction, what do we do? We should pause and pray. Jesus puts it this way in verse 10. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, now that's a redundant and a repetitive statement. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Because listen, when God's kingdom comes, his will is going to be done. We should want God's agenda, not our own. Because sometimes we need to remember what matters most. See, our country, I think we can all feel it. It's on the wrong agenda right now. We need God's agenda. We need God's agenda in our life. We need God's agenda in our family. We need it in our economy. In every area of our life that we can think of, we let God's kingdom come and be among us. In the middle of the day, when we are tempted to get back to our own agenda and forget God and do it on our own, we take time to remember what matters most, that we align ourselves with God's purpose and his plan. If we line up our plans and our purposes with God, he's going to help us get what matters most done. Matthew 6, another promise. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Do you feel like you don't have enough time? Put God's agenda first. Don't have enough money? Put God's agenda first. Don't have a lot of energy? Put God's agenda first. You don't know which way to turn? Put his agenda first. You have a major decision to make. Put God's agenda first. In the mid-morning, you remember what matters most, and it's God's will and purpose for your life. Now let's go to lunch. The middle of the day, the break in our day, Jesus tells us that we can list our needs to him. We list my needs at lunch. Verse 11, he says, Give us this day our daily bread. What does bread represent? Well, in the Bible, bread represents the things that we need. It represents our money sometimes, our resources represents the stuff that fulfills us. It's the stuff that sustains us. It's anything we need in our lives. Now, it's important to know what he said. Give us today our daily bread. We ask God what we need for today. I need you to understand something. God's not really interested in what we need next year, even though we might be, because then we wouldn't need to trust him. If he revealed the answer for next year, we wouldn't need to trust him. We wouldn't need faith. We wouldn't need to depend on him. See, when God led the Israelites out of Egypt in the book of Exodus, he fed them. Every day he gave them manna. It only lasted one day. It would rot the next day. They were told that you can't store it and hoard it for the next day. It was literally daily bread. Why? Because they had to depend on God every day. Same goes for us. We can admit that life can get pretty overwhelming pretty quick. We need a prayer life that helps us depend on God every day. Perfect time is to do it in the middle of the day when we're eating lunch. We list our needs to God. Our life is about faith and trust and dependence on him. We ask him for what we need. We ask him for what the people in our lives need. I love how Philippians 4 tells us about this. Paul says, do not be anxious about anything. 
but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your request to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus when things get overwhelming what do we do we're not anxious we go to God in prayer we list our daily needs to him and then there's a promise there and then we will receive the peace of God that passes our understanding because we took the time to pause. We took the time to ask God for help. At lunch, we list our needs. Now, number five, I ask for forgiveness in the afternoon. Now, by the time we reach towards the end of the day or the end of the middle of the day, well, we can start getting a bad attitude because of maybe some of the people that we encounter every day. Some people can frustrate us. Some people disappoint us. Some people will hurt us intentionally. Some people will hurt us unintentionally. We need to take the time in the afternoon to stop and pray and ask for forgiveness. Verse 11, Jesus says, Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Psalm 139 puts it this way, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Listen, we, we don't need to carry that baggage into the rest of our day. It's like taking out the garbage. Not a fun job. But taking out the garbage actually doesn't take a long time. But it keeps our house from stinking. If we don't do it for our soul every day, our soul can start to stink too. Based on what somebody's done to us, things that we've done to other people, things that wrong choices we've made. Listen, this is the prayer of confession. We own up to the wrong things we've done. We admit our sins. And while we're at it, we ask God to help us forgive those who have also wronged us. Because here's what I want you to know about a grudge. A grudge is going to hurt me more than it hurts anybody else. You don't need to carry that for the rest of your day. So in the afternoon, you ask for forgiveness. You take a pause. And I want you to understand this. There's never any reason for you to walk around feeling guilty if you know the Lord. Listen, we regret our past a lot of times. We worry about our future, and by doing that, we, we just waste today. We walk around feeling guilty. We crucify ourselves on the cross of guilt and resentment, and we carry that with us, and we can't even have a clear mind about anything. So we pause in the afternoon, and we ask for forgiveness. We clear it. Because Jesus died for us on the cross, so we don't have to carry the guilt. So in the afternoon, we ask for forgiveness. Now we're getting to the end of our day, heading home, punching out, Getting ready to drive home from work, wherever you are, be done with school. So number six, I ask God to help me make wise decisions. I want you to know that when we get to the end of the day, psychologists will tell us that it's a prime time to get into an argument with somebody else. In fact, 90% of all arguments happen one hour before dinner. We're cranky, we're tired, we're overwhelmed, and we've got low blood sugar. We need to get home, but we need to take a minute. And we've got to make the conscious decision to not carry the problems and the worries of our day into the house with us. We leave it outside, and in that moment we ask God for wisdom. Listen, you, whether you have kids at home or not anymore, we need to ask God to help us make wise decisions. How am I going to be the best that I can be for the rest of the day? Protect me from making dumb decisions. Protect me from taking all of what I'm worried about and anxious about and dumping that on somebody else. God, I need wisdom in this moment before I step in this door. Verse 13 says, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Here's a great promise when it comes to facing temptation, which, by the way, we usually give into temptation most of the time when we're feeling tired and overwhelmed. Any kind of temptation, anger, secret sin. So we consciously take a moment, we say, God, I need wisdom. Don't let me fall into temptation. Second, 1 Corinthians 10 says, No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Listen, we're all going to face temptation to do something wrong and to other people. We have to make a conscious decision to use the relationship we have with God to say, God, I, I don't want to make the wrong decision. Listen, it's common, but we serve a God who always gives us a way out. And so here's how I want to end your day. You should end every day with a benediction, which is a nice way of saying we end the day with a good word. We need to end our day with some promises from God. 
One translation of the Lord's Prayer puts it this way. It ends it by saying in verse 13, For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You need to remember that God is in control. The world changes when God's people pray. He's waiting on us. He's depending on us to depend on Him. To give control over to Him. Sometimes we wait for God to show His control, and other times I think He's waiting for us to give up control to Him. That tells us that His is the kingdom. But it also tells us that it's not the end of the story. Because He's got the power and the glory forever. We end our prayer, we end our day by remembering that God is in control and this isn't the end of the story. You know what? If you read the last part of the book, God wins. And I'm going to leave you with this great quote from Corey Ten Boom. I think it's perfect as we pray throughout our day. She says, if you look at the world, you'll be distressed. That's so true today. We look at the world, we are distressed. If you look within, sometimes you'll be depressed because you know you can't handle everything on your own. But if you look at Jesus Christ, you will be at rest. Now, I don't just want this for a moment for you. I want you to have it throughout your day. All of these different times throughout the day, you'll start to see that you're going to have a running conversation with God. And if we look to Jesus, we'll have peace. If we look anywhere else, we'll be depressed and distressed and overwhelmed. Would you join us on this spiritual growth campaign and commit ourselves to 40 days of prayer? Now, if you're listening to this broadcast today and you haven't chosen to follow Jesus yet, we want to give you that opportunity because all of these benefits of prayer and and the relationship with God, it's available to you and you just simply need to do what the Bible says and you ask God for forgiveness and you let him be in charge of your life because it's the best decision you could ever make. Listen, you're starting to see that when you look at the world, you get distressed. When you look inside, you can get depressed. But we promise you that if you look to Jesus, your life and your soul and your mind and your heart will be at rest. And then you can begin to pray to God throughout your day, and he will answer you. So I simply want to offer this invitation to those who have not decided to follow Jesus. But you're here today, and there's something tugging on your heart, and you know you've got to make a decision. That's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. We want to give you this opportunity to follow Jesus. So would you pray this prayer with me? Listen, I know you might have a lot of questions, and that's okay. But let's take this first step together, and then we can help you build the foundations of what it looks like to follow Jesus. Pray this with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your Son, Jesus. Thank you for helping me to understand that you are accessible to me. I don't have to go to anybody to find you. You are right here. God, I I admit I've done some wrong things. I've made some horrible decisions, and I need forgiveness. But I know that you'll forgive me, You'll put your goodness inside me and you'll lead me on the right path. I want to tap into this power of prayer. I want to to rise each day and end each day by talking to you and, and tapping into the purpose that you have for my life. So I dedicate my life to you today. And for the rest of my life, I choose to follow you. Develop habits inside of me, Lord, so that I can follow you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. You prayed that prayer. We're so glad that you did. We want you to tell somebody. We want you to connect with us. We'll have a way for you to contact us at the end of our broadcast today. But we're so honored that you would spend time with us. Listen, if you want to get involved in doing, we've got some outreaches into the community coming up so that we can let people know about Jesus, especially with Easter just a few weeks away. You can visit our website at newcityde.org. And we would just love for you to uh, listen to some older messages. We have some messages on there about, about prayer, but also about following Jesus. And we'd love to show you what, we, what our church is about and, and what we believe. So you can visit us on our website. And if you're comfortable, we'd love to meet you in person and pray with you, get you a Bible. Uh, every Sunday morning in our uh, Sunday morning services, we have in-person worship every Sunday at 10 a.m. It's safe. It's an environment for you and your family. But we just love gathering together as the people of God. And so we want to invite you to that every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Listen, we're loving that you're here with us today. We are absolutely uh, hoping that you are encouraged by this, that you are challenged by this, and that we would all stop looking to the world and stop looking to ourselves, but that we would look to Jesus and that we would receive that peace. Let's all start to pray throughout our day. God bless you and have a great day.